Good evening, everybody, and thanks for coming. Adrian N. Breitfeld, your city clerk. You are hereby directed to call a special session of the City Council to be held on Monday, May 20th, 2024 at 5.15 p.m. in the historic federal building for the purpose of conducting work sessions on the historic Millwork District Master Plan and Inclusive Dubuque. And just a footnote, I just opened an email from the mayor. He's most likely not going to be able to join us live tonight. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a special session of the Dubuque City Council for May 20th, 2024. As a reminder to viewers and listeners, due to the nature of tonight's meeting topic, public input is not accepted. However, you may contact the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Pro Tem Jones. Here. Council Members Farber. Here. Roussel. Here. Sprank. Here. Wethel. Here. City Manager Van Milligan. Here. And City Attorney Brumwell. Here. Thank you. Our first work session topic is the Historic Millwork District Master Plan Update. I will turn it over to Economic Development Director Jill Connors. Good evening, Jill Connors, Economic Development Director. We're here. We have the Historic Millwork District Master Plan to a point where we think we're ready um, to bring it to you in final form. So tonight's uh, the opportunity to give you one last look at it let you give us some questions uh, and feedback before we bring that final draft to you, hopefully next month. Um, we're gonna have Andrew Dresner from Bolton and Mank present this uh, information to you. Thanks. Good evening, thank you for having me. Um, appreciate the opportunity to present this update to you all um, on the historic Millwork District Master Plan. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so the purpose of this plan was to basically update the original plan, which was completed, I believe, in about 2000, I think it was 2010 or so. So the purpose was to take stock of the redevelopment and see how we've done and, or how the city's done and make adjustments as needed. Um, it was also to better understand the impacts of, the, of our post-COVID economy, which was um, a, a serious, serious topic of discussion two years ago. It's a little bit less, but it's still relevant. I see your six feet apart signs are still here, which aren't quite as relevant, but mm -hmm. we are in a po definitely in a post-COVID economy um, and, and that ha definitely has a bearing on on the district and in your downtown. Um, and then to ensure the district is guided by its many stakeholders. Um, when the original district plan was done, um, it, it didn't have a lot of on-site stakeholders because the district was essentially empty at the time. And since that time, we have a lot of residents, a lot of businesses, a lot of visitors. So there's a richer, more complex network of stakeholders in the district. and as is often done 10 years after a plan, you do a slight adjustment to take into consideration those new, uh, the, the new and existing stakeholders. And then also to kickstart the next cycle of um, redevelopment. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So as we look at the status of redevelopment, um, the site is, or the district is basically in the triangle area. Um, and the red buildings are those that have been uh, newly constructed or for, or redeveloped. Um, frankly, the only new construction buildings are the intermodal ramp and the station. Otherwise, um, the red buildings are those that have been redeveloped um, since 2010. And the purple buildings remain underutilized or un undeveloped. Um, essentially, I think it, it's fair to say it's about half halfway done. Um, the first cycle of development was about 700,000 square feet of of, of, of new building, of redevelopment, and there's about another 600 or 700,000 remaining. Um, and it wasn't uh, a piece of cake. It was very difficult, as you guys know, and the city put a lot of um, investment in it, in this area and in the, in the downtown. Um, and, the, and generally speaking, there's quite a bit of, quite a bit of success and um, uh, praise, not just locally, but nationally for the district. Just a couple photographs here that show the changes from 2010 to 2023-24. Uh, 
Um, you can see the buildings are still there, but they are inhabited um, and cleaned up and the roads are completely done. Um, uh, they're done in part of the district, I should say. And I can recall when I worked on this originally, um, uh, one of the building owners said, described the district as a place where you can um, bre break an ankle or an axle. And it was true. I mean, the roads were, they were completely rutted up and now they are modern roads. Um, so the process involved had a, quite a bit of um, stakeholder and public engagement. We had a steering committee of 15 members um, that uh, represented both, the stakeholders um, included businesses, or business owners, I should say, within the district, residents within the district, um, property owners within the district, but it also included people that did not directly live in or work or do business in the district. So for example, we had a, a, a student um, from Loris, I believe it was, who was on the steering committee representing not just herself, but also representing a young voice. Um, and someone who comes to the district occasionally, but not a lot. So we tried really hard to have a, um, this diverse steering committee, diverse <coughs> set of interests. We also conducted a series of focus groups in which we dive deep into specific issues. Um, we also participated in the Arts Cafe a couple years ago, in which we had about 50 or 60, 40 or 50 or so um, artists, and we uh, conducted a workshop with them. And then a couple other uh, broader outreaches, night market, public survey, et, et, et cetera. Um, and this uh, engagement process was really important because, uh, again, the district now has new stakeholders who were not part of writing the first plan, and this is an opportunity for them to be a part of the update plan. Um, we had a market and economics component to the study, and I'll just go through just a few uh, of the highlights. Um, essentially, the, the district has experienced slow and steady growth, um, and it, 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 it's, it showed itself to the marketplace as a, place for, a strong place for housing. So housing um, came on into a couple of the new buildings uh, relatively quickly. Um, what we learned is that the buildings were larger than expect us, uh, not the building, sorry. The units were larger than expected. We um, anticipated um, smaller units for uh, uh, students or uh, young professionals, um, but due to building size, the unit layouts were a little bit larger than expected. Um, the retail and commercial has been slower to absorb than housing. Um, and that's not uncommon, typically retail, um, we say in the business, retail follows rooftops, so you need the rooftops first. Um, and you need foot traffic um, for retail, and that's been, a, a, at times, has been a little bit slow. Um, another important market finding um, was uh, that, and this has sort of been a, a slow uh, sort of emergence of urban um, retail, is really in, in the world of food. As we know, that, as we know uh, m much retail, traditional retail um, product retail is now done online. Um, and many of uh, urban disposable income is now moving more in the, in the food area. Other areas about market finding uh, were interesting. Um, you, you, as you know, you're a modestly growing city and a modestly growing county. Um, I found it interesting that your natural, you have a natural decrease um, when you look at birth and death numbers, but you actually, your, your, your uh, slow growth is mostly by in, uh, in migration. And you get a lot of immigration um, from the Des Moines area, from the nearby counties, and actually from Chicago as well, which I, I found pretty interesting. Um, it, it, as a city, you have a lot of smaller households. Um, soon, your major, you'll have, uh, I would probably in the next 20 years or so, you're going to have a primary, primarily one in two households. One in two person households will be the dominant household in the city. And, uh, I bring that up because, um, for a, as a city, you also promote uh, historic preservation. So you have a building stock that's built for one population and a different population. So it creates some, some challenges. Um, so a couple market findings. So what did we hear in our engagement? Um, for res from residents, they love living here. They love it. They love showing it off to their family, to friends. They love it. That said, um, there are a couple, there are some daily amenities that are lacking 
in the district and in the area, in particular, say, grocery, um, green space. So there are some things, but they, generally speaking, residents speak with great satisfaction towards the district. Um, from some business owners, uh, we heard that it's actually, a, um, as, as, we, as many business owners or office uh, managers are struggling to get people back into the office, getting them back into the district um, is not that hard. It's a great place to be. You know, it's, it, uh, as, and that's different from other, and perhaps even your main street, I'm not even, I don't know, but it's definitely different from a lot of downtown areas. Um, retailers tell us that uh, it's tough. You know, retail stuff no matter what, but the lack of foot traffic makes it a little bit hard, but it's a prestigious location. And they, uh, one of our, I can recall one business owner told us that she's moved her business um, three times in Dubuque, and every time, and she moved, in a sense, she moves up, um, and this is her third or perhaps even fourth location, and to her, it's an, an advancement. Um, from neighbors in the general community, um, for some, it's, it's a destination. It's a great place on a weekend. Um, for visitors, we know it's a destination. Um, but this is an interesting finding. For many people outside of the district and outside of the downtown, the Millwork District's not really on their radar. It's not really on their radar. I thought that was really interesting. Um, and from lenders and developers, um, they remain bullish on housing and hospitality, but not a little less so on, on, on retail and office. And that's pretty common. Um, and it, it, all that said, we're in an interest rate environment right now where everything's sort of slowed, but I think it's, it's all safe to say it's cyclical and will eventually move out. So some of the main findings um, relate to public space. So almost across the board, there's a sense that the public space, despite what the, the wonderful job that was done on the new roads, um, there's a, there, there's a lack of a gathering space. There's lack of outdoor usable space, not just for daily users, residents, and office workers, but also for, for visitors in a sense that a space for all those users would benefit the community a great deal. Um, there's another important finding is that the district lacks a broad cross-section of people on a daily basis. Some days there's a sort of a flood of people that come in as visitors or for events, but it's not a daily or weekly occurrence. Um, the district is not particularly well connected to other parts of the city, um, whether it's because of a viaduct on one side or um, heavy roads on the other side. Um, people know where it is, but there's a little bit of a disorientation or a little bit of a kind of an abrupt way of getting into the district, which is tough. I mean, I think we all know that when we, when we go to new places, if you kind of like take one wrong turn or you get a little bit confused, you, 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 don't, you don't go further. For habitual users, that's not a problem, but for newcomers, that's a problem. Um, the district has a curated feel to it. It is clean. It is nice. Um, but we, we did hear that it, in doing so, it has a little bit of the unintended consequences of an air of formality um, and uh, maybe even a little bit of exclusivity. So it lacks a little bit of um, serendipity or a little bit of uh, um, you know, impromptu activity um, of uh, sort of personal expression. And then finally, the district lacks just some, imp some of those amenities that are important for daily users to make it a really a neighborhood. So the, the project has this vision statement. Uh, the historic mill work district will connect people to the history and future of Dubuque, to each other, to surrounding air districts, and to the larger region. And the design of the district will achieve this by focusing on these three areas, the built environment, economy, and culture. And that's really the structure of the plan. There are three main sections, built, eco built environment, economy, and culture. Um, and I'll go, uh, I'll, I'll go through a couple of those um, recommendations, but this is an, a page in the document I think that's really important, and it basically lays out all the recommendations on the left side in those three categories, built environment, economy, and culture. And then it um, lists those 
aforementioned strengths and weaknesses on the top, and it connects those re the recommendations to how they um, support or enhance the existing strengths, or how they mitigate the existing um, weaknesses or, or uh, liabilities of the district. So a couple of the main, main ideas. Um, firstly, to com completing the redevelopment is really important. So there's another, in a sense, half, half way to go, as I mentioned before. Um, to do so, uh, th these are big buildings. They're big, complicated, tough, tough, tough buildings. They don't happen without um, historic tax credits at both the state and the federal level, as well as additional support. Actually, on the way in, I s you, you guys walk by it probably every day, but there's an article down in your lobby announcing when Governor Culver was here in 2010 or 11, um, announcing the tax credits for the for the, for the buildings that have been completed, um, they are really important. Um, so supporting those tax credits is a, is a key piece here. Um, the, the roads on the south portion of the district have to be rebuilt. Um, they were never built in the first round, so I don't want to say that they're, they were done once and have to be done over again. Um, the plan talks about infill housing between the district and Main Street, and that relates to some of the connectivity issues, as well as recruiting an anchor tenant, um, in particular for the lumber shed building, which is a spectacular building within the district that sort of sits there, and uh, once, it, once people understand how spectacular it is, it, it, I think it, um, it might take off. Um, and then focusing on a, a few key amenities, such as the community space, um, simple food and lunch options, as well as um, a neighborhood grocery. There are other important ideas relate to connections and wayfinding, and then promoting the arts and placemaking. So I'll go through a couple of the important points within each of those categories. So within the built environment, um, there's an, uh, what we call a stretch goal, and we call it the tower to tower connection. Um, so the shot tower to the uh, clock tower. Um, in recent months, we've uh, been suggested maybe this should, don't, don't forget that just beyond the clock tower is Duma and J Jackson Park, is it? Or is, or, Washington. Is that right? Is it Jackson or Washington? Washington. Washington. Okay. Uh, Duma and Washington Park, which is just another block. Um, but that could be an, uh, another one of these, uh, or uh, an important east-west connection through the downtown, through the district, all the way down to the port and the riverfront. Um, and then also the plan talks about and promotes bike connections to the Port of Dubuque, Chaplin Schmidt, B Branch, and the Port of Dubuque, um, connecting into existing paths that you and trails that you already have. Um, and it's not just the specific connections that are important, but it's also the entry points which are important. Um, so the plan has recommendations for enhancing the underpasses um, to the viaduct on the east side of the district. Um, as well as improved wayfinding as you um, make your way towards the district or as you come down off the, the viaducts or you know, directional signage that explains where the district is um, for visitors. Um, I mentioned the, the community space, and that's a, that's probably, that is the most important recommendation. It's something that popped up in almost all discussions. Um, so the plan recommends replacing the parking, parking lot that is in front of the uh, intermodal lot with a community space, a public space that works on daily basis as well as a space that works um, for larger events, and uh, a place that's artful, a place that is seasonal, a place that is social is really the way we put it. Um, and I, th I think this is a really important next step recommendation um, or project for the district. Um, as it relates to the economy, um, the plan speaks to, and rec I mentioned this also earlier about the, the tax credits for those remaining three, four large buildings on the south portion of the building, the Farley Letcher, south portion of the district, the Farley Letcher, the Lumber Shed, the Kirby, and the Wilmack buildings, um, as well as pulling an an uh, landing anchor tenant in the district preferably a, a tenant that has a connection to the um, mission of the district. Um, it might be uh, recreation related, it could be arts related. 
the lumber shed is an obvious possible building for that. And then also, um, though outside the district, the plan recommends um, new housing to be located just to the uh, west of the district in, in that gap between Main Street and the district. Um, and that construction could fulfill some of the need for smaller units, more simple units, that the first phase of development did not accomplish. In the area of culture, um, <clears throat> this is a, a, there are a couple important recommendations here that relate to things like signature artwork, that relate to events that bring people of different from all around the community and all around the region into the district. Um, interpretive signage that teaches about the history and, uh, and the future of the district, as well as promoting um, educational tours, maybe even an artist in residence program. We hear of, you know, mu museums often have artist in residence programs. This district could have an artist in residence program. Um, in terms of immediate actions um, coming out of this plan, um, I mentioned the community space. That's really important. Um, uh, losing that parking in the middle of the district will, will cause a little bit of heartache for some people who use it frequently. It is replaceable. The parking study feel that uh, the, the city completed um, justifies that. Um, but what, what we think might be a, a good idea is in the summer or in, in the, uh, in the uh, to, to take a portion of that parking lot, just a portion of it, and turn it into a, a public plaza, a low cost, simple, shaded space that is uh, social, it can be artful, um, it comes at the expense of just a couple of parking spaces, just to start to lay, idea, lay seeds of idea, um, ideas of how to activate the, the space. Um, eventually, uh, concept design for this community space will need to be done. Um, it, it, we, we believe it's best if this is a public space and it's a public RFP. Um, we know that there are probably some issues, some environmental issues, sub, subgrade. Um, it's important for any design of the space to take into account maintenance of it, programming of it, use of it, and a broad set of stakeholders. Um, and then there are a couple small little projects such as uh, installing a four-way stop sign at 9th um, and, and 11th in order to slow some of the traffic movement through so, to, so as to make the district a little bit more pedestrian friendly. Um, and then also, as we understand, there's, there's this summer on 9th and 10th, there's going to be a pilot project um, for uh, bike lanes to improve that, connect, that east-west connectivity between the district and, the, uh, and downtown. So, that's an overview of the plan. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, you mentioned that you had um, a committee. Uh, da, 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 sorry, it was mentioned early on. Were they um, the steering committee members? Mm -hmm. Were they actually fairly active in meeting with you guys? Because it looks like you had monthly meetings. Did, did you have good attendance from all those folks? Um, we had pretty good attendance, yes. OK. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. I know we had some folks that were concerned prior, uh -huh. and hence yeah, why we kind of got good. to that. So I want to make sure that yeah. those voices were, were heard. So all right, good. Glad to hear. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. When you speak of um, starting with a smaller park and then just to really almost get a taste for what that feels like, you give some great examples of, um, I think we've all probably seen maybe something like it where it's more like places to sit that are more artful and unique like the bottom photograph actually, mm -hmm. um, or actual just green space with some benches. When you start, start with a smaller space, what do you prioritize? Um, I would prioritize daily use, <laughs> you know, simply a place to be outside to have a lunch, you know, simple, simple, simple use. Um, eventually, it could grow into, or maybe it, in day one, it's, it's sort of a, I mean, I could imagine it being a kind of a, a welcome landing spot. In the summer, you have a lot of visitors coming into the district. Um, 
it could be a information kiosk. Your, you know, the chamber could have a little bit of space there to help orient people, like you know, welcome to Dubuque sort of space. Um, but I, I, I just think a, a simple daily use kind of place, because you do have workers coming in every day, and you have residents there every day that are, you know, they they're in apartment buildings without, um, you know, modern rooftop amenity decks. I know the Dupaco building does. Um, but I would prioritize real simple, basic, everyday use. I wondered what the space would be to create some sort of a, this is the history of the millwork um, space. So on our river walk, we have, you know, informational little platforms mm -hmm. present for people to learn. Um, is, you know, would you put that in a space like that where people who were visiting could say, oh, so what's the story of the Millwork District? And yeah, you something that's could. almost like yeah. a um, informational space. Yeah, or... you, yeah, definitely. You certainly could. I, um, I would consider everything as temporary, though. Yeah. You know, this is about just testing out a space. This is about sort of demonstrating that the loss of a few parking spaces is okay. So, the, you know, the investment has to be kind of commensurate with, with that. Thank you. Mr. Sprank. Yeah, another follow-up question. So when you're saying 9th and 11th streets, the stop signs, are you saying, I'm just looking at Google Earth here because I like to have visuals like yeah. Jackson and Washington yeah. streets is where you're thinking of on the, on the 11th and 9th streets? Yeah. So, okay. All right. Yeah, explain. one of the, you know, the, the district is somewhat hemmed in. The, co the core of the district is a little bit hemmed in. Um, and uh, so people don't venture beyond the core much. Um, and I, I think that would help a little bit. Yeah, because I, I travel down Jackson to get down there a lot. Mm -hmm. And when I'm crossing, usually 11th, it can be sometimes a bugger to see and at not so much at and at ninth, and it would be nice if we could, you know, slow down the traffic coming at you. That's just so you can see better. So, but I get the I understand because they want the whole neighborhood to be more walkable. So, mm -hmm. thank you, Mr. Sell. Thank you. Um, there was a, a comment that you made that the area is not on the radar for some people. So um, I didn't see anything in the plan that that addresses that. How do the people who don't live there, don't work there, yeah. how are they going to learn about this space and want to go there? So there's some, um, a good question. Uh, there's some recommendations in the plan that simply relate to like uh, uh, media outreach or uh, 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 having a stronger online presence. And that's, that doesn't do everything, but that's part of it. Um, I, I think long term when thinking about that park or that space, um, it, it, should have a, it should have a magnetic quality to it. It should have a, a gravitational pull to it. Um, it needs to work on a daily basis just to have lunch. But when you think of, and this is going to stretch it a bit, but when you, like when you, in Chicago, you know the bean mm -hmm. in Chicago? I mean, that has an incredible magnetic quality to it. Like, it, it almost has a, its own gravitational pull. So there's, it's a signature artwork. Now, I think that's part of it, having a signature piece of artwork that pulls, that, that is a destination in and of itself. That's not the only solution, however. Um, I think it's important for the expression of the park both in its physical makeup as well as in its programming to be appealing to the entire city. That's really important, I think. So can it be a place that promotes local artists from around the city as well, perhaps? Um, can it promote activities, um, uh, what, you know, uh, passive or even recreational activities that are used by people around the city, perhaps? Um, so. I think those are some of the ways to bring people back, bring people down into the district from around the city. That's helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Ma Mr. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, thank you. Um, thank you very much for paying honor to the city's past by what you're doing architecturally and the design. I can tell that you've spent many hours with many people crafting um, all the different phases here of this plan, so I greatly appreciate that. Um, I do recall when it first opened that there used to be um, some kind of a grocery outlet mm. right there down in the Millwork District, and it did not have much success. Uh, and now that we're looking at that whole area has kind of uh, been repurposed with other uses and other commercial spots. Um, I was just wondering for the um, lumber shed building, which is huge, uh, and has many possibilities, has there been any discussion or how would you recommend there be discussions about getting a um, grocery style outlet or some kind of a food court or something uh, down there? Um, I don't know if that, the lumber shed is such a unique building. Um, I, I would be, I'm not a grocery expert, but I think it's a tough space for a, gr a grocer. Is there another space that you would recommend down there? Um, I, th I, I, I mean, there's many buildings I think that the, could be repurposed. Actually, I, when I visited the several years ago, the, the grocer that was there that mm -hmm. wasn't, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, that type of grocer does actually succeed in, in the next phase of development. It just might have been ahead of its time. You know, it was, it was small, but I don't think there's a market right now for a larger grocer. So I wouldn't be surprised if, and that was, I don't know how many square feet it was, but that could fit in either the Farley, mm -hmm. any of the undeveloped buildings. The lumber shed is such a special building. I mean, that, that's a destination type building in and of itself as well. Um, so I wouldn't, I would be surprised if that's a grocery solution. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Resnick, are you on board? Did you have any comments or thoughts? Well, first of all, thank you. And um, thank you to Ms. Redfelder for getting my chat note. And uh, so I appreciate the uh, appreciate the presentation, a lot of good ideas. I want to uh, talk again, like many of them, about what you called a little heartache, which would be um, making the parking lot transition into a green space community area, which I think is important. But I think um, I would love to see that you talk to the stakeholders about the sequencing of that transition. Do they have the buy-in with this small start and realizing that they're going to lose this parking? Because when I go down there to events, that parking space is really important for those businesses there who, want, who are making money. So uh, have you talked to them about this transition? Thank you very much. Um, yes, and as part of the whole downtown parking strategy, and I think actually since the last time I was here, I've started to see some of those changes with the Park Dubuque signs and branding that uh, has recently been installed. And that, that helps because it kind of uh, sends a message that everything is one system. Right. Um, part of the parking solution is um, uh, is also related to um, acknowledging that the center of the district, the parkers in the center of the district, whether they're on the streets or in the intermodal ramp, um, are are super important for retail. Super important for retail residents. Um, they're they're a little bit more flexible. They can park a block, a, a block or on the perimeter of the district. So as that change happens, um, it's sort of a it's like a big, sh a set of small shifts. Um, so I, I I think that the as as long as the as long as customers who are coming to the district can have a eighty percent certainty that they'll find a space on the street or in the ramp, it'll work. If the ramp is fully filled with residents, it'll be problematic. So it's a, it's a complicated parking game that has to be played that, to serve all, all the users and to price it correctly as well. That's another important piece. Um, Thank you very much. And I, I hate to interrupt you. 
Um, but one last question, this is based on uh, Ms. Roussel's um, question about how do we get down there, people down there. So uh, a lot of people still feel that that area has security issues. And um, besides, you know, I would like to hear your idea specifically about lighting, which uh, the, the brighter it is, the more people feel comfortable, yet the brighter it is, the residents don't necessarily want that. And we don't want to create too much light, but is there a lighting plan that you uh, have thought about that combines security and comfort? Thank you. Um, no, I uh, lighting came up a little bit um, if I recall correctly, I wouldn't say it was a, a dominant feature of the discussion. Um, uh, there are probably some dark spots that, and unused spots that could be enhanced with some lighting. But you're right, you don't want too much lighting. It is a neighborhood after all, so we have to sort of protect lights inside, uh, you know, bleeding into, into windows. Um, the best way to combat security issues, is, of course, I think we all know, is is street life, <laughs> people. <laughs> is there, having people there uh, is the best way to uh, create a safe environment. And I know that it's easier said than done, um, but uh, um, specifically as it relates to lighting, the plan does not have a, a specific lighting plan in it. Great. Well, thank you very much for your answers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Resnick. Um, anybody else? Well, thank you for an excellent presentation and update. Um, it's exciting to see where we've gotten, and it's a little daunting to see where we have to get, but I think it's uh, I think it's doable. And and like all things that we do, it'll be baby steps uh, with great results. So thank you again. And, um, if there's no other questions or or comments, so we, we can stand this work session adjourned and, and be in recess until six o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.